Hello, everybody. Welcome to Heart of the Matter. I am your host, Elizabeth Vargas. And if you listen to this podcast, you know we talk a lot about the fact that fewer than 20% of people who need help dealing with substance use disorder actually get help. It is, I think, the only disease I can think of that anybody can think of where the numbers are that small. I mean, think about it. Cancer, diabetes, heart disease, people go get help but they don't when they're dealing with addiction. And today I have as my guest, the, one of the nation's leading experts on addiction, Michael Botticelli. He uh, has more than 30 years experience in the field. He was during the Obama administration, the director of the Office of National Drug Control Policy, otherwise known as the drug czar. He was the first person actually to have that position in any administration who actually also had first-hand experience in recovery. Michael Botticelli has more than 32 years sober, and he's got a lot to say, and I had a lot of questions for him. With the pandemic still raging and people really still struggling with mental health and substance use, we thought it would be a great time to welcome Michael Botticelli. I think you're going to find him really interesting. Michael Botticelli, welcome. As you know, um, I spoke a while back with the drug czar for President Trump about what he felt like he had accomplished while he was uh, in that position. You were the drug czar for President Obama. Drug czar is the, is the nickname it's been given. <laughs> um, and as I just said, you were the first person in recovery to hold that position. You know, you've done so much work over so many years fighting the stigma that surrounds the disease of addiction. And, you know, I was so struck a couple of weeks ago in listening to the George Floyd trial and listening to George Floyd's girlfriend take the stand and in very emotional testimony, talk about the battle that she and George had fought against opioid addiction. And the fact that days before his death, um, she felt that she could see the signs that he had relapsed. And the reaction in the public, especially on so many newscasts that I watch when people were expressing sort of like surprise that the defense would try and hit her on that because so many people, as they said, every family in America has experienced addiction in one way or another through a loved one, a member of the family, a neighbor, a colleague, a friend, that sort of thing. What did you think of all that discussion about addiction and her testimony? So, so despite, I think, the statistics that you just cited about how widespread addiction is, you know, we, we know that stigma still pervades people's attitudes with, uh, with addiction. You know, so from my standpoint, and probably to, to a lot of other people's, you know, it really wasn't a surprise. I think it's an all too familiar narrative, mm -hmm. quite honestly, that, you know, his drug use uh, becomes kind of central to the defense's uh, argument. And, right, and I'm they're not trying to argue he died because he had a small amount of fentanyl in his system, yes. not because a police officer was kneeling on his neck for nine minutes and 29 seconds. Correct. And, and, uh, and I'm not talking about the medical components of it, right? Mm -hmm. I, I, that's really for, you know, forensic psychologists. I think what those of us who really understand this issue, you know, have known for a long time that when you talk about someone's addiction, um, you know, it conjures up this image in most people's mind. This is how stigma manifests itself, right? In bad people and bad characters. And that, you know, and we've seen this time and time again, and that if someone, and not in this case, it's pretty apparent he did not die of an overdose, but that those people who, you know, are addicted and who do die as a result of their addiction are somehow less human and mm -hmm. those those lives are like not as tragic um as people who die from other medical conditions so you know i think it struck me and a lot of other people that you know beyond just the medical considerations and the forensic considerations of it that you know um uh, drug use you know does have a tendency in most people's minds to make us think less of the person 
Um, and, you know, and even though someone might have had a history of recovery, you know, that relapse is often seen as a failure, not just kind of part of what many people's normal recovery trajectory is. So, you know, I, I, I do think, you know, I really fear um, and suspect, you know, quite honestly, that, you know, the drug use issues um, mean a lot more to people in a negative way than just what the medical repercussions uh, were in those situations. Right. I found myself feeling so happy to hear all these, you know, journalists on television saying every family in America has experienced addiction and this is not going to be the death you know, now that I think the defense attorney hopes it will be, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. And then I thought, yeah, but <laughs> yes, but um, still so many don't seek help because of, you know, the stigma and the shame around the disease. Fewer than 20% seek help. Polls show a third of Americans think addiction is a moral failing. Mm -hmm. A third so there, there is still a, 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 uh -huh. an, an enormous, you know, component out there of people sure. who blame the victim in this case. And, and, and quite honestly, media portrayal is a really powerful messaging tool where many people do feel that stigma, right? So, you know, even in the context of opioid addiction, you know, it's often characterized in a criminal justice, in a crime way, like, like we see in this case, um, or from a moral failing. So, so how the media contextualizes that and the words that they use in, in even covering that are, are, are really powerful um, kind of conveyors, if that's the right word, uh, you know, they, 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 how the media talks about this and how they portray it and how they put that in context, I think are really, really powerful in terms of either destigmatizing addiction or perpetuating the stigma of it. You were talking just a second ago about the fact that people often blame the addict when when they die or something happens to them and they're under the influence. You know, I was struck by the fact that when rapper DMX recently died, there were people tweeting out uh, one in specific that I remember responding to. Um, he had all the money and resources he, he could have in the world and he didn't get sober and it's his fault. Yeah. Um, you know, it was like, wow, really? Wow. Well, you know, and I, and I also think we have to kind of name the kind of intersection of stigma and race, right? Not only in DMX, but in George Floyd, like I, um, we see that with gender too, right? So, you know, with pregnant women and addiction, there, that I think that there is this intersectionality with kind of the stigma of addiction and things like racism and sexism and homophobia. So, so you know, they really can, you know, when they're combined, they, they, I think, can really be, you know, tremendously powerful um, in terms of, of, of playing into people's um, uh, kind of attitudes around that. But, you know, I, I think we have to acknowledge that there is, you know, this intersectionality between stigma and kind of race and class and sex and all the other kind of, uh, uh, kind of systemic issues that we have as a culture. Are you saying people were more judgmental of DMX or George Floyd because they were black? Oh, absolutely. Absolutely. One, one of the things when I was the drug czar that, that really struck me, you know, quite honestly, as many people say, and I think there's some truth to it, that, um, you know, our, our general approach to opioid addiction as a health issue um, and the consensus around that in no small part was a function that it affected the, the vast majority of people that it was affecting were white people. Um, so, you know, so, so we I took it more seriously because the victims were white. Yes, exactly. You know, and, 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 and again, I think had a much more sympathetic and a much more health focused response be, because it was largely white people that, that, that it was affecting. And, and I think we have to acknowledge that, that, you know, um, our response and, you know, our drug policy, um, was, you know, kind of not only rooted in addiction as a moral failure and as a criminal justice issue, but, uh, but around issues of race and particularly for people of color. Rather than a medical issue. We certainly Rather saw that when it came to criminalizing crack cocaine versus powdered cocaine. Correct. 
Correct. You know, you know that's, and, that that I think is a really stunning example, right, from our past, where um, you know where there were dramatic different um, uh, uh, sentencing options for crack cocaine versus powder cocaine because of who, you know, because it was like the white app, you know, here's our image, right? The white affluent Wall Street banker doing, you know, cocaine and, you know, and African-American poor folk uh, using crack. Two versions of the same drug. Two Let's versions make of very the same. clear. There's yeah. nothing, you know, there's no difference. They're just in two different forms. They're two different forms. It's funny. You mentioned also women are judged more harshly with addiction. I was just talking about this with the actress Kristen Johnston on this podcast. And she feels that, and I agree, that there's somehow a drunk woman is seen much more judgmentally, like, oh, uh, and it can often prevent women from seeking help or admitting to somebody that they have an issue. Yep, no, absolutely. Uh, you know, um, I, 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 one of the more stunning examples kind of from the opioid, uh, you know, epidemic, I, I remember um, that uh, there were a number of states that were actually enacting enhanced criminal penalties, particularly for pregnant women, who had an opioid addiction, right? So, you know, despite the fact that, you know, we were, we were moving this as a health condition, that there were many states that had, you know, uh, you put uh, uh, enhanced criminal penalties for pregnant women, you know, with- But couldn't the argument be made that a pregnant woman is not just putting her own health at risk? She's obviously putting the health of her unborn child at risk. Yeah, but, but I think it misses the understanding that for many women, Pregnancy can be the event where women actually do seek treatment. And the last thing that you want to do is, you know, is, is scare a, a pregnant woman so that she won't come for help, right? So uh, um, she comes forward when she's pregnant and says, I need help getting detoxed or off this drug or off alcohol. Well, you it, know, and again, and I think I she think could face that, charges. Yeah, you, you know, to that, you know, that will do everything. Um, to kind of keep uh, women out of care, but but to me, it's you know it's a very stunning example of you know how kind of um, kind of stigma and gender um, and gender discrimination kind of play into our our response to addiction. So which is it? I mean, I was filled with optimism as I read the stories and heard the reports of how George Floyd's girlfriend humanized opioid addiction with her testimony on the stand, and yet so dismayed to see, um, amid a lot of the tributes to DMX after his death from an overdose, you know, that handful of, of and, and getting a lot of play of people blaming him mm -hmm. for not being able to get clean. Mm -hmm. Are we at a point where we should be feeling hopeful and optimistic about chipping away the stigma and the shame, or are we still, you know, waist deep in the morass of judgment and shame and, and moralizing and criminalizing and blaming the victim? I, you know, I, I, I will forever be an optimist uh, around this. And I, you know, I, I, I do think that there is cause for us to be optimistic about it. And, you know, and I think, you know, George Floyd's girlfriend is a great representation of how, you know, when people come forward in a kind of authentic, real way, uh, like yourself, and talk about their stories, mm -hmm. like, I, that's how we begin to change opinion. And it's it's been really interesting for me, as I'm sure it is for you, to kind of watch people... Um, uh, and I, I don't have scientific evidence around this. This is just my mm -hmm. observation. Mm -hmm. How people often feel much more comfortable about kind of talking about addiction in their own family, right? President Biden just did it. Right. Hunter Biden is putting it in his book. So President so Trump had a brother who died of President, alcoholism. You know, so President it, George Bush himself suffered from alcoholism. You know, he did. And and I think that, you know, and I, I saw that in my time in Washington. I saw that in my time around the country, how often people, when they're talking about this issue, will often talk about it from a personal standpoint, about mm -hmm. either them, their family member, a friend that they had uh, uh, around this issue. Um, so, so, so I, 
because I do think that's one of the foundational ways that we begin to continue or, or that we continue to chip away at the stigma uh, around uh, around this issue is by, you know, us, you know, by this kind of collective coming out of our own of our own stories. And, and, and I do see that, uh, um, you know, I do see that changing, um, you know, we certainly have a, you know, a ton more work to do, but, um, but, but the other reason that I'm, you know, I, I'm optimistic is, you know, uh, uh, as I get more advanced in my years, you know, there's this whole young generation of people who are really living their lives out loud. Um, about their recovery and their addiction and their sexuality. And right. it's really, I think, um, opening up a different world and a different conversation that we're having. So, you know, I, you know, we're seeing, you know, kind of young people in recovery. We're seeing the, you know, the proliferation of, you know, collegiate recovery programs. Mm -hmm. So, so I think it's really going to be kind of young folks who, uh, do um, kind of really take up the charge and and kind of change the conversation and really normalize the conversation uh, around addiction. Right. I think that the one thing, you know, that I, I think watching George Floyd's girlfriend on the stand talk so emotionally and vulnerably about her efforts repeatedly, you know, to stay sober and clean and the relapses and the fresh starts and counting days again, um, I, I I do feel like perhaps it was a tiny window for for many Americans to see what it's like to live with this disease, especially this particular addiction to opioids that is so powerful and so yeah. difficult to break. And to see her be very honest and open about the fact that we tried repeatedly over and over, and you know then we would relapse and then we would try together again, yeah. and we we both started taking these painkillers because of neck pain and back pain, like. You know, everybody's got neck pain and back pain <laughs> there, but for the grace of God, go I. If you know, some doctor prescribed me, you know, an opioid pain reliever that I became addicted to. Yeah, I, you know, I think you hit on really kind of two important points here. One, one just the common experience that many people had mm -hmm. around being prescribed opioid medication for right. pain, or, um, or you know, kind of. Uh, I, I mean, it was so prolific that you know, everybody basically had a prescription for pain medication. And I think right. many people said to themselves or, or said out loud, like, wow, I was really lucky here. Like, right. you know, I, I didn't develop an addiction and, you know, various reasons why. But, but I, you know, I think the, the other point that you mentioned that I think really resonated with many, many people is their experience with other people with addiction, right? So how many families have we heard the same stories mm -hmm. with loved ones who, you know, had repeated attempts uh, around recovery? So, um, you know, I, I often heard, uh, and I think I'm right around this, that it that it, it takes about eight quit attempts for smoking before you finally achieve uh, you know, recovery from smoking. And the same mm -hmm. is true with addiction, right? That that we know it often takes numerous attempts at a recovery. It's almost like we're practicing recovery, you know, until we achieve a significant time uh, of, of of recovery. And 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 I think many people can understand, you know, can understand that story and, you know, and have lived that story. So so not only did she, I think, kind of humanize you know, her own challenges, but I think kind of her experience really resonates with people on many levels. I was so struck by something you said when you confronted stigma of your own when you were nominated to be President Obama's drug czar. You said at one point a congressional staffer told you that there was no way you would be confirmed as drug czar uh, because of your past. And this was despite the fact that you had been in recovery for more than 20 years years yeah. i can't believe that is that true it it is true and and i think it's um unfortunately pervasive in our society right you know the longer that i am around and i am in this field you know it really is i've really fundamentally come to the conclusion that you know unless we fundamentally change the way that people view people with addiction mm. um and reduce that stigma 
that we're still going to encounter those kinds of attitudes no matter where we go, right? So, so the United States government is not the only employer, quite honestly, that you know I think has a level of stigma around um, uh, around addiction, mm-hmm. and that stigma very clearly pervades public policy. So, you know, my good friends at Johns Hopkins Bloomberg School of Public Health did a survey on uh, how people view people with addiction. And, you know, uh, uh, significant numbers of people said that people with addiction don't deserve health benefits or don't have a right to hold a job, didn't want to marry into a family with someone with addiction. So, you know, it's really, um, so, so when we talk about stigma, it sounds like it's this amorphous thing. But when you really look at kind of policies and how people feel, um, it's really, I I think, fundamental for us to change our attitudes about people with addiction, because I think that then subsequently changes public policy. Is it disappointing that more isn't being done, given the fact that we have two men in the White House who have personal experience with this disease? I I, I, absolutely. It's it's really heartbreaking for me. you know, and, you know, even I'm very proud of the accomplishments that we made, you mm-hmm. know, but I, you know, I don't think any of us felt satisfied with what we had done, you know, particularly in the middle of the opioid epidemic, you know, I, ca- I can't help but reflect, um, you know, uh, uh, you know, today, I'm not sure when this will air, but today, you know, uh, will probably surpass a half million people who died of COVID, right? Um, but we're approaching that same number of people who died of a drug overdose. And we don't hear that. We don't hear it reported. You know, certainly the number of overdoses have skyrocketed in the middle of this COVID epidemic. Oh my gosh, uh, we have a mental health crisis and nobody's we, really talking about that. It, they are, I mean, but not as much. I mean, not with as our much, kids not as especially, much, but, I think young adults and children are being impacted, you know, more than we can even imagine with anxiety, depression, you know, a, a use of substances has gone yeah, way yeah. up as a result of this pandemic. It's really hitting people. It really is. But but I think, you know, you know, you were talking about stigma. I, I, I think that's one way that stigma manifests itself, right? So like the, the you know, and, and I, n- not to diminish any of the kind of heartbreak and significance around the COVID epidemic, but nearly that same number have died of a drug overdose in the United States. And like, somehow do we feel like those people, like that, that there's less heartbreak, that there's less um, attention to it? Um, you know, the, the older I get, which is kind of getting old now, um, you know, it, 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 it really kind of breaks my heart that I feel like the entirety of our work has been to get people to pay attention to this issue. And, and, I, and I still think um, we have a really, really long way to go before people kind of see the urgency um, uh, around not just the current opioid epidemic, but just the urgency around dealing with substance use and mental health issues. You know, maybe, maybe this pandemic and the ramifications and consequences for years to come, maybe it will. Maybe it will shine more of a light on it. Mm. But, but um, you know, I, 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 you know, I think it's 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 always been a challenge to to have people respond to this um, uh, the way that it deserves. I can guarantee you that many people blame the people who die of drug or alcohol uh, overdoses. I mean, I, I, the, 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 I hear it all the time. You I, know, I, I um, think that's their part fault of it. for not I, I think that's part of it. And I think, you know, like I've always, I've always heard, yeah, like it might be a disease, but they still did it to themselves, right? You know, right, like um, it's a choice. Like it's a choice. I mean, you know, th- there are behavioral components to diabetes and heart disease and a whole bunch of other diseases, but we don't withhold care and treatment because there are behavioral components to it. Right. So, so I, you know, I do think it's, it's that uh, sort of thinking that actually pervades our, our response and prevents, um, you know, a much more robust response to this issue. You know, when we talk about those precarious early days of sobriety <laughs> um, and sort of the expectation, uh, unrealistic uh, though it may be, of so many people, family and friends around the person in new recovery, it's like, well, you're all better now. And, and it's, we, you know, we don't expect people 
with cancer to just stop having cancer. Like it's all better now. You know, we wait until you go back for the six month checkup and the year checkup and the five year checkup to make sure you're really cancer free. We're patient with people with cancer um, in a way that we aren't with people in recovery. And, yeah. you know, relapses in recovery are greeted with much judgment. Um, not just from loved ones, from companies who say, I'm sorry, you relapsed, you're fired. Yeah, you yeah. know, nobody says that to somebody whose cancer came back. Yeah. Um, so, you know, even though the statistics show that only a third, God help us, only a third of people think addiction is a moral failing. I think personally, the numbers are three quarters to, you know, even higher. Still blame the person who struggles. You know, a, a, a couple of things kind of reflecting on what you just said here, you know, actually many addiction treatment programs actually kick people out that if they have a relapse, right? So, you know, and I often thought it was, uh, and I think it was William White who kind of said, you know, we need to stop kicking people out of treatment for exhibiting the symptoms of the disease that they have, right? right. Um, it, but, you know, here's the, here's the positive piece about this. I think that one of the things that I think that we are seeing, you know, in the United States um, not only our longer continuum of care, but much more emphasis on recovery supports, not just the, you know, kind of inpatient treatment, but, you know, a significant influence in understanding that people need a whole host of recovery supports to, to, to maintain and get to long-term recovery, right? So um, whether that, whether those are things like recovery high schools, mm. collegiate recovery programs, recovery support centers. Um, you know, I think are things like, you know, one of the things that I always used to hear in the data support this out, um, that, you know, people, I always used to ask people in early recovery, like, what do you need most to, to be stable in your recovery? And invariably they would say, I need a job and I need housing, right? And so it's really interesting that you know, we are seeing this movement toward, you know, recovery friendly housing and recovery friendly employers. I think more and more employers are understanding, you know, that not only do we need to support employees with addiction, but we need to provide them with ongoing recovery and support. So, so I, you know, I'm heartened that, um, you know, uh, we are kind of seeing, you know, and that gets played out not only insurance reimbursement, but, you know, federal grants, I think, are supporting, you know, uh, not just high-end kind of acute treatment, but mm -hmm. much more emphasis on supporting people, um, not just in early recovery, but throughout their recovery. So, you know, I, I, I'm very uh, I'm, I'm optimistic that people are, are understanding the chronic nature of this disease and that relapse is often a part of it. Um, and so, and ensuring that people have adequate access, not just to treatment, but to all the supports they need, you know, to, to, to get to long-term recovery. You are actually, um, what I would call the unicorn in the room <laughs> in that once you decided to get sober, you stayed sober. I did. Yeah. I did. You've been sober for 32 years, 32 years now. It's kind of, it's, it's really amazing, but, wow. um, but, you know, you look back and um, a, a reporter once asked me if you had to say one thing that contributed to your long-term recovery, what would it be? Mm -hmm. um, and without hesitation, I said a recovery community. Um, it, it, and I'm still getting a little chill talking about it 32 mm. years later. You know? Uh, you know, when I first came into the program, I was just surrounded by all of these people in in recovery who like we just ran around as a pack together yeah. like we went from meeting to meeting to meeting and we hung out and we went to breakfast and we went to dinner and we had coffee together and you know and, and you know many of them are still you know my friends to this day and you know i i really do think that um uh you know that's what um you know, th th that's where I am 32 years later. And I think that many people who are in long-term recovery, um, you know, uh, um, I shouldn't speak for other people, but can, you know, attribute to on their ongoing recovery to how close they stay to a program and how close they stay to 
to to other people in recovery. Yeah, there's nothing like the power of sitting in a room with people who nod their head and say, me too, when you <laughs> share your most embarrassing, <laughs> most, you know, mortifying, um, deeply, you know, secretive stories that yep. you, you feel great shame about. Great shame about. And we laugh, right? I know. <laughs> can, the power laugh of laughter. And, you, yeah. know, it's, it, uh, you know, I, I, I really do think that, you know, it's, it's, I think it's a good illustration of the the power of people's stories, right? Mm -hmm. Not only to heal each other and to heal ourselves, but in that same vein to diminish stigma and to decrease some of the um, shame that that people have. Um, you know, you know, I've often said that you know, kind of being in recovery this long, I've heard tens of thousands of stories, mm -hmm. right? And you know, and invariably they you know, they always move me. Yeah, um, me too. Right. And, and, you know, you would think we would get desensitized to that, no, you know, never, but they don't. Never. And, and, and I do think that there is, you know, something significant in, you know, in saying out, saying those things out loud, um, you know, um, uh, so, so, you know, I, I firmly believe in the, you know, in really in the power of people's stories to, you know, to, to heal ourselves, to heal other people. And, and, and I think to make great advancements in, in how we view people with addiction. I, I think I've always said that I think part of the power of those meetings is that I can hear other people's stories that are so similar to mine and I can show them empathy and, you know, and be so much more generous toward them than I am toward my own self. In other words, it was by listening to other people's stories that it taught me to finally forgive my own self for some of the things that, you know, that I did when I was drinking. No, it's, you know, it's, it's, I think it's, it's really, really true. I think it's in, you know, it, that power of identification of right. hearing, hearing yourself and seeing yourself in other mm -hmm. people that, that, um, you know, I, I, I think it's really when the kind of restorative power of recovery co comes into play. Finally, I'm just curious, what are the three things you hope to see the Biden administration accomplish um, and the and whoever he appoints as your successor is a in the position of quote unquote drugs are? Well, you know, I think first and foremost, just, you know, kind of re really leaning in to implementing you know, uh, programs and services with proven effectiveness. I think that that is, um, you know, kind of particularly important. I, you know, I think that the second thing um, is, you know, I, I really would like to see this as a priority within the administration. Like, uh, you know, I can, I can tell you from experience, you know, when uh, the president and the senior people in the administration say things are a priority, things happen. Um, mm. And so, um, don't you think is a good chance of that, given President Biden's son's very public struggles? And I mean, I don't know. I know there's a lot on his plate right now with this pandemic, mm -hmm. and unfortunately, a lot of things get sort of you know set aside. But um, I don't know. I'm, I'm, I'm maybe I'm call me call me too optimistic or naive, oh. but I'm I'm really optimistic that he will. Um, because I remember, you know, interviewing him a couple of years ago and he about the book he wrote about his son, Bo. And um, he said to me, I read your book. It was really great. And, you know, my family, we have these issues, too. And yeah. that he's never had a drink. He told me he's never had a drink in his entire life. Yeah. Um, so I don't know. I'm, I'm hoping that he's aware enough to make that a priority. Because as you said, there's nothing more powerful than the commander in chief saying yeah. this is a priority. I, 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 do, I do feel optimistic. I really do. And in, in a number of ways. You know, one, when he was a senator, he, he was actually one of the co-authors of the legislation that started uh, the Office of National Drug Control. So this is an important priority to him. I think his personal connections to mm -hmm. this are, mm -hmm. are particularly important. I think we've seen evidence by the people that he has appointed already. Um, you know, one of the things that really excites me, uh, uh, hopefully by the time this airs, they'll be confirmed. We have two cabinet secretaries um, who are actually openly in recovery. Who? Um, uh, so uh, Mayor Marty Walsh from Boston. Mm -hmm. uh, Mayor Walsh is a good friend of mine. I've known him for a long time, who's very public about and uses every opportunity to talk about his own recovery. And Deb Halland, 
uh, mm. who's uh, the nominee for Secretary of the Interior is, not only is she uh, Native American, but she's openly in recovery as well. We've seen a number of appointees already um, who are openly in recovery. And, and you know what that says to me is not only this is an important issue, but instead of seeing recovery as a liability, see it as an asset, right? And so that gets me really excited uh, you mm. know, when, when I uh, see that. Um, my, my good friend, Tom Coderre, is the acting administrator for SAMHSA. Tom is, you know, not only is he a great guy, he's openly in recovery. So, so I think we have every reason to believe that this is gonna uh, be a, a priority. Um, not, not only now. So, and the last thing that, that I'll say in terms of, um, you know, kind of what I think our focus should be is, you know, I, I think it's really, really important, um, you know, to focus on things that, are, are, you know, one of the things that we've seen with the COVID, we, we, we had begun to make some, a little bit of modest prog progress in, in drug overdose deaths. You know, unfortunately this epidemic, um, you know, has reversed that curve. And I think there, right. are 40, there are 40 states now that are experiencing significant increases. So I think there's some near-term work about, in, you know, uh, implementing uh, programs and policies to really reduce drug overdose deaths in the short term. Right. By the way, uh, did anybody in your confirmation hearings ask you about your recovery? Any of the senators? Uh, no, no, right. no. So, so after the Senate congressional staffers said, I don't think you're going to make it. Yeah, you know. yeah. Uh, you know, I, I was actually, um, uh, I, I was actually unanimously confirmed by the Senate. So it was, it was like 92 to nothing. So, um, and, and that, that also gives me, um, I, you know, we're living in a highly partisan world right now and highly partisan government. Um, but I, I hope that level of kind of bipartisan support for how we approach this, uh, you know, continues in Congress, because I think that's really, really important that, you know, that we not have to play politics with this issue. And so, you know, um, uh, I think it's, it's, you know, uh, I think it's, um, uh, ho I feel hopeful that uh, there, we'll continue to have significant uh, a bipartisan congressional support for this issue. Michael Botticelli, it's great to talk to you. And really, your uh, your your recovery is inspirational to those of us who are less far far along on the path. Um, but most importantly, the work you've done on behalf of people who suffer from this disease and families who are so impacted by this disease um, can't thank you enough. And look forward to seeing what great. else you do on this. Thank field. you too, Elizabeth. And you know, and again, I think it's uh, just I've been so I'm kind of so grateful to be able to meet you and talk with you. I've uh, been equally impressed by your openness and your honesty and your willingness um, that can often come with great consequence to be open about your own recovery. Yeah. And, and, you know, glad to see that it has actually had the opposite effect that you have flourished. <laughs> Well, I'm hoping um, we can get to a day when we're talking about all these cabinet members and, you know, so many people in my field, so many people in so many fields are in recovery. It would be great for people to be open about recovery. It doesn't define you. That's not, you know, I'm many, many, many other things, right. yeah. as are you. Um, but it would be lovely if more people were more open, I think. I think it would do a lot to help reduce the stigma that still really impacts and, you know, frightens so many people away from getting the help they need. Yeah, I, I do. And, you know, if we can end on a really positive note, um, I think it's really young people who are changing that. I think that many, many young people uh, uh, don't um, live their lives openly, whether that's, you know, in social media or other. Uh, mm -hmm. I, I, I think we are just seeing an explosion of young people who, are uh, just much more willing to be open and honest. And, and uh, you know, I, I think that that gives me kind of great hope for the future here that, that we are gonna see a, a big change in people's attitudes. From your lips to God's ears, as they I say. <laughs> Thank you. Thanks so much. Great to talk to you. Great, good to talk to you too. Thank you so much for listening to my talk with Michael Botticelli. You can find this podcast on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, and on our website at drugfree.org slash podcast. And as a reminder, if you need help with a loved one who is struggling with substance use, you can text 55753 or visit drugfree.org. Talk to you soon.